So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Manel Luhan, who is a respiratory physician who works with patients who require long term ventilation at the Unif Hospi University, even hospital of Park Tauli in Sabadell, Barcelona. Hello, Manel. Hello, Michelle. How are you? My I'm pleasure to, to speak with you. I'm going to let you in your own words just briefly describe um, where you work so the listeners to today can have an idea of your background because you've got so much knowledge I don't think I'd do it just you justice saying what I know about you. Thank you uh, well I'm the responsible responsible of the non-invasive uh, uh, ventilation program, the chronic non-invasive ventilation program. I work uh, also in the respiratory intermediate care unit, but uh, regarding non-invasive uh, chronic or mechanical ventilation, I have a background of more than 20 years uh, and with this uh, kind of patients. And uh, I have also a small laboratory, I'm speaking from, the, from my laboratory now, uh, with a lung simulator and uh, all the equipment to test the ventilators uh, here in, in bench conditions. Fabulous. And with your huge cohort of patients, do you utilize remote monitoring for that group? Yes, uh, we we usually manage our patients with uh, with telemonitoring, but uh, telemonitoring encompasses a, is, is a huge concept. Uh, uh, telemonitoring uh, can be, uh, for example, the uh, online or online transmission of data, uh, but uh, in my in my opinion. The real-time telemonitoring uh, has a limited value in the management of this kind of patients. For me, it's more, it's more important to have the possibility to download the information inside the ventilator, for example, after each uh, session use. This is the most important thing we use uh, in telemonitoring and uh, with a stratified approach, for example, the compliance, uh, first step, the compliance, second step, the leakage, third step, uh, the events of uh, upper airway, and fourth step, not uh, available in, in, in some ventilators to have uh, the information about the patient ventilatory asynchrony. But, uh, for example, the, 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 the most important thing is the, the stratified approach in, in telemonitoring. And I know that you've adopted telemonitoring for a long time. Um, I think there are certain centres coming in at the moment that will be adopting it because of the COVID situation and the fact that we can't have as much face-to-face -face contact with our patients. And it, is a useful tool in order to get the information, like you've said, is your patient compliant? Do they have mask leak? Is there a residual AHI? And then if you still can't find the problem to home down and look at the data, it is key. Did you have any barriers between either yourself or any members of the team to take up or to utilise monitoring? Or was it just sort of it came along and you naturally embraced it because I know that we had concerns about how much work it would be for us as a department having all of this new info coming in on a daily basis. Yes, the, 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 uh, the problem with telemonitoring is uh, for me is how to organize the, the, the chronic non-invasive ventilation program based on telemonitoring because uh, Telemonitoring needs uh, somebody to, to take care of the information, to collect the information, to interpret the information, uh, who, uh, that, uh, to, to take care about the, or to manage all this information. And uh, the human factor is really important uh, and the organization is really important. Because uh, one thing we learn from the pandemic, from the COVID-19, is that uh, we we are able to manage 
our patients not uh, visiting face to face every time. So, for example, uh, in our chronic uh, chronic non invasive ventilation program, we try to to combine uh, the face to face approach with the uh, telemonitoring. And I believe this is especially important. We have to identify what kind of patients need to be uh, treated face to face or need to be visited face to face at the hospital, and what is the subset of patients who can be safely treated with uh, or managed with telemonitoring. So um, our purpose is to stratify the, uh, all our patients in two groups high risk patients. These high risk patients um, need to be treated um, with uh, periodic uh, visits at the hospital and with the supplementary information with telemonitoring. But uh, we have a, a subset of patients with uh, low risk, with less exacerbation, with less progressive disease, for example, uh, obesity, hypoventilation syndrome, hyposcoliosis, stable COPD, and so on. Uh, this kind of patients, uh, I believe uh, they can be managed uh, safely with telemonitoring. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a key point. It's not necessarily a specific diagnosis that, that works best, that telemonitoring works best for. It's like you say, it's those patients that are not exacerbating regularly and that you want to keep an eye on and you want to support them um, yeah. are relatively stable, but you need that little bit of extra information that you would normally get when they come to the hospital if they bring their ventilator and you look at it. Yeah, I agree. It, that's a good way to think about it. Did you did you formalise a protocol for how your patients would be managed? Because I see what you're saying. You're saying you need a key person who can sift through all of the information and say, OK, we've got four patients that have got leak problems and go to maybe your technician or your physiotherapist or whoever deals with the, the mask and the leak side of it. And then it's like, OK, well, this patient, um, I can see that they're using their ventilator more. Um, there's no problem with leak. Perhaps that they're, they're becoming unwell. I need to go to to you for that. Um, so did that just happen? naturally or did you sit down and write out a protocol for how you were going to manage them? Yeah, uh, we don't have a specific protocol but uh, we we work in coordination with uh, whole, with the with uh, with the home uh, therapy provider uh, and uh, we have a, a, a key a figure here uh, who is a physiotherapist, who is the coordinator of a non-invasive ventilation program. And she is in charge of this kind of information. And she works uh, really closely with the, with the uh, home uh, care provider at home. And uh, the, 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 the information between this both uh, actors is, uh, is the, the, the key point. Uh, for a good, uh, for a good, for me, for a, for a good success of the uh, telemonitoring. So, the, for example, the home care provider can download the information uh, when, when he, when the, the, his or her physiotherapist goes home uh, uh, of the patient, and uh, uh, the, the information is transferred to the hospital. And our coordinator at the hospital decides uh, what uh, with, what we can do with this uh, patient. For example, if it's uh, mandatory to change the mask, to perform a polygraphy, uh, and so on. But uh, for me, the two key points are first of first of all to stratify the patient in high risk and low risk patient, and second the the, the communication between a home care provider and the physiotherapist who is in charge here at the hospital of the uh, non-invasive ventilation uh, program. Perfect. So really, in order so to make it easiest for the physiotherapist and the home care provider, would you say that you need an easy, intuitive system to use that has the ability for 
the correct members of the team to log on and, and see the data when it's highlighted rather than necessarily print stuff off and because you don't have access but you say look at this and you can see exactly what the problem is. is yeah the for me the, the most important thing is to identify the most important problem. The problem is the compliance okay okay uh, we need to encourage the patient to to improve the compliance. The, 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 the main problems are the leaks, okay, change the mask, uh, and so on. The main problem is residual upper airway obstruction, uh, try to perform a polygraphy. Perfect. Even at home or at the hospital, it's possible to do it at home exactly. with the new devices. And sending out even oximeters to plug into them and having that information back is, is yeah. so useful down the line. Exactly, bells, oximeters, and so on. And are you utilizing the belts at home? At home, not yet, but uh, <laughs> nah, yeah, not yet. Yes, because uh, um, I tried to start the, the, the use of the belts at home, but the, the pandemic uh, delayed everything. And, and I think it's key for people adopting telemonitoring that you don't need the in-depth stuff. You can get a lot of information from the basic stuff, can't you? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because uh, our sleep lab is really, uh, we have a waiting list for several months. And if we can solve this patient, this, this problems at home, it's really, really important and uh, save uh, a lot of money to the hospital. For save sure. a, really a lot of money. I'm going to say thank you very much for sparing the time to talk to us about telemonitoring today. I know you're incredibly busy, but that's been such good tips for people when they're just getting used to and getting um, on board with the monitoring systems that are out there, um, especially as, as we've been highlighting that there are drivers to use remote monitoring now because we can't see patients as much. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle.